This video is supported by Brilliant.org. Humans are a very distrustful species. Throughout history and across religions, philosophies, cultures, there's been this constant, inherent, what can only be called skepticism, that our perceived reality is not actual reality. From the belief in heaven and hell, which basically means that our world is only one plane of existence amongst many, to the belief that we're only living in a dream of a deity named Vishnu, to the belief that we live in a matrix-like simulation, or the idea that the entire universe is just a hologram or a projection of a parallel universe. No other species does this. I mean, we can tell anyway. We seem to be the only species that looks around and says, I think there's something else going on here. Of course, we're also the only species that uses a written language and wears clothes and has hair on the top of our head that never stops growing. We're weird. It's like, do we even belong here? <laughs> It's like we weren't even involved here. We were just seated here by some alien civilization that wanted to... Oh God, now I'm doing it. The push for knowledge is based on this skepticism. The idea that there's something else behind what we experience in the world, something that we can't see. And it's led us to some really bizarre ideas about the nature of reality. Ever since Anton Leeuwenhoek pointed his microscope at a drop of water in the 1600s and saw little squiggly things floating around in it, we've been on a quest to find the smallest piece of matter. In other words, what is everything made of? It was the Greek philosopher Democritus that first popularized the views of the atomists, who believed that there was a smallest unit of matter called the atom. Kind of sounds like they nailed it, right? But their idea of atoms was way different from what we believe now. For example, they believed that atoms had different shapes according to the type of element that they were a part of. For example, iron had hooks in it so that the atoms could bond together and that's what made iron so strong. But the biggest difference is they thought the atom was the smallest possible unit of matter and was therefore indivisible. Which in our modern understanding of atoms we know isn't true. They are very divisible. In fact, you smash them together, they just divise all over the place. And what comes out of that are fundamental particles, 17 of them total, electrons, quarks, neutrinos, bosons, and various masses and colors. Catch them all! The way this crew of particles combine form all the subatomic particles and the atoms and the fundamental forces of nature that make up the entire universe. The sun, every black hole, the very dry winter air in this room, the crusts of blood inside my nose that keeps bleeding because of this winter air is all made up of these 17 particles. So there it is, the smallest elements of matter. We did it. We finished science. Except these particles kind of have a habit of, like, not making any sense. The beautiful, elegant rules of relativistic physics that we experience every day just doesn't seem to apply to these guys. They have their own set of rules. Acting like particles, traveling like waves, this wave-particle duality is the basis of some of the biggest arguments in the history of science. So we find ourselves with two completely different types of physics, general relativity and quantum mechanics, which get together about as well as oil and water. The Hatfields and the McCoys, or Kevin and Todd. You don't know them, they're friends of mine, but they hate each other. The search was on to find a way to merge these competing theories. Enter Paul Dirac and his Dirac equation. Paul Dirac was known in his time as a brilliant, but strange man. Today he'd probably be considered on the spectrum, but this quirk in his perception allowed him to perform feats of mathematics that were borderline superhuman. So when he tackled the problem of reconciling quantum mechanics and general relativity, it's no surprise that he was able to boil it down to a single elegant equation that incorporated the particle wave function, the Planck constant, which solves for quantum mechanics, and relativity. This was the birth of quantum electrodynamics, a huge leap forward in our understanding of how electrons and electric fields behave. This theory is, to this day, the most accurate and precise mathematical theory that we have. Richard Feynman once called it the jewel of physics. But Dirac's equation ran into a problem. According to the equation, the electron would constantly be losing energy as it spiraled down toward the nucleus, giving off light as it did so. And this obviously doesn't happen. There needed to be some kind of support structure of energy that kept the electron from losing its charge. And his solution for this was what he called the Dirac C. He proposed an infinitely deep ocean of electrons that exists everywhere in the universe with charges ranging from zero to infinity. Electrons with the heaviest charges sink to the bottom and electrons with the lightest charges, the ones that we're most used to, float on top. This 
doesn't exist. <laughs> but it did perfectly explain the activity of electrons and predicted antimatter years before it was actually observed. More and more the predictions of this theory were being proved by observation. Over time this gave rise to the idea of an electron field. Instead of an electron floating on top of a sea, it was embedded in a three-dimensional field. A field that rests at zero energy, or vacuum energy as it was called, and the electrons were just spikes in energy or vibrations in the field. This way the electron could exist both as a particle, a fixed position in space, but travel as a wave, as a vibration in the field. And the idea of a quantum field was born. Not only was it an elegant solution that provided both for quantum mechanics and general relativity, but it's been proven over and over again through experimentation to be one of the most accurate models, mathematical models of reality in existence. Not just for electrons, but for all the fundamental particles. For all 17 of the fundamental particles, there's an associated field. There's electron fields, there's neutrino fields, there's quark fields, W and Z boson fields, and most famously, the Higgs field. 17 fields, overlapping, intertwining, filling every point in space in the entire universe, making up everything that exists, including you and me, and the brain cells that make it possible for us to understand this. This is, to the current limits of our understanding, the true nature of the universe. Have you ever noticed every time we find a new best idea about the true nature of the universe, it's always weirder than the last one? But maybe the weirdest thing about quantum fields is even when they're at their lowest energy state, the vacuum state, they're still full of energy. This is a simulation of a quark field. It was created by a supercomputer based off of mathematical models. The scale of this is incredibly small. Only a couple of protons could fit in the volume of this cube. And it's running at 1 million billion billion frames per second. Areas where it turns red are where quarks are popping in and out of existence. Here's a quark. Here's a quark. Everywhere a quark quark. For the tiniest fraction of a second, and then they're gone. These are called virtual particles. By constantly bubbling up and dissipating, they strangely keep the field in a stable state. But you don't need a supercomputer to see evidence of these quantum fluctuations. All you need to do is look up at the night sky. Because in the earliest moments of the Big Bang, trillionths of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, it's these quantum fluctuations that caused matter to coalesce out of this raw energy. Matter that became subatomic particles and then hydrogen atoms, which formed eventually into stars and galaxies and everything we know. And you can still see this in the cosmic background radiation. As the universe expanded, the energy in the earliest moments was directed by these incredibly tiny vacuum fluctuations. And you can see the imprint of those fluctuations on the CMB. Kind of like the shadows of people that were found around Hiroshima after the bomb blast, frozen in time. The CMB is the shadow of the vacuum fluctuations in the earliest moments of the Big Bang, frozen in time across the entire observable universe. Now this is mind-blowing for many reasons, but one of the big ones is that these quantum fields and the quantum fluctuations that they contain existed in the very earliest moments of the Big Bang. Did they exist before the Big Bang? Did they cause the Big Bang? We don't know. This is where our knowledge stops. What we'll find out next is impossible to say, but if history is any guide, it's gonna be weirder than we can even imagine. Humans are a skeptical species. Throughout history, we have always believed in one way or another that reality is not what we think it is. And science has kind of proved us right. How did we know? What clued us in? There's a hypothetical that I'd like to ask, so I'm going to ask it here. Let's just say we came in contact with a very advanced alien civilization that actually knows everything there is to know. They have no more questions anymore. And they were able to tell us what the exact nature of reality was. How close would that be to our current understanding? Do you think it would even be close? Do you think it would be something that we wouldn't even be able to conceptualize? Tell me what you think in the comments. Whatever answers we come up with in the future is gonna take brilliant people to get us there. And for that, there's brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is a learning website with a twist. It doesn't just make you memorize facts and figures, it teaches you how to learn with games and puzzles and problem solving that you can use in your everyday life. Learning things is cool, but when you can figure out things on your own, ah, that's the stuff. They've got fun courses on everything from the physics of the everyday to the physics of black holes from artificial neural networks to learning how to win at card games. You can make some money off of this. You can sign up for free and get access to their daily puzzles if you go to brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and the first 200 people that sign up for their premium subscription, which gives you access to all their courses, will get 20% off your subscription for life. 
I've really been enjoying it. I know you will too. Brilliant.org slash Answers with Joe. Links in the description. And of course, if you like my shirt, there's this and dozens more cool designs available at answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. This is being done in partnership with Michael Sobel at sfsf.com. He is a brilliant graphic designer in Prague. So buying this shirt helps support him, helps support the channel, helps you look cool. Everybody wins. So go check it out downstairs, uh, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. And last but far from least, I want to thank the Answer Files on Patreon that are helping me keep the lights on around here. There's some new members of the tribe whose names I get to murder right now, and those people are uh, Joe Koontz, good name, uh, Franz Cadet, Eddie Donlin, Daisy Miguel, James Floyd, Willen Woods, Mario Alfario, Ruman Rumanov, Powell Bierilo, and Fernando Martinez. Not too bad. Thank you guys so much for signing up. If you would like to join them, and get access to free perks, and maybe eventually get yourself on the wall back here, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Like and share if you like it, and if this is your first time here, welcome. I hope you enjoyed this video. I've got many more that YouTube is probably sharing over here on the side, and if you like those, I encourage you to subscribe. I come back with topics just like this every Monday. All right, thanks so much for watching. You guys go out, have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.